Good evening and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, important uh, discussion. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, it's a huge honor uh, for us to have the special presidential envoy for Global Coalition to Counter ISIL, General John Allen, uh, here to speak on the future of the fight against ISIL. Uh, he's a close friend of the Council, uh, and we're truly honored to welcome him here in this capacity. Uh, this event forms part of the Council's important body of work on the Middle East and the array of issues contributing to a crumbling order in the region. Uh, in our uh, Scowcroft Center on International Security, we've hosted war games, uh, in fact, just last week, with former senior leaders as players on the current situation between ISIL and the U.S.-led coalition, uh, the results of which were presented last week on February 26th. Uh, I won't go through those results. I want to leave time for uh, General Jones' introduction of General Allen, General Allen's comments in the Q&A. Let's just say that when you're sitting in a room trying to figure this out, even in a theoretical way, you really learn how difficult these decisions are, uh, decisions about life and death where it's very uh, uh, uncertain what impact a single decision may have on the outcome. Our strategic foresight initiative has taken a long-range look at the Middle East, particularly trends shaping the region for 2020 and beyond. Our Rafi Kariri Center for the Middle East is doing fantastic work on the transitions in the region and through its experts has spearheaded much of the thinking on the U.S. role in combating jihadism. It's been particularly strong on the questions of Syria. As such, our team follows closely the work of General Allen and his partners in their efforts to degrade and defeat ISIL. The coalition's objectives are vital to the future of the Middle East and global security, from providing crucial military support to regional partners, to impeding the flow of foreign fighters, an ever more crucial task, to obstructing the financing of ISIL's operations and addressing dire humanitarian crises. General Allen and his team have an enormous task at hand, and we look forward to hearing more from him about that. Um, Please note that we're live tweeting this event. This event is on the record, and we're using the hashtag, hashtag AC Mideast, uh, so we can continue this conversation online. And now I'd like to welcome General Jim Jones, uh, the chairman of our Scowcroft Center on International Security, to, to the stage. As you know, he was Supreme Allied Commander Europe, former National Security Advisor to President Obama, and a fellow Marine uh, to General Allen as a former Marine Commandant. General Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fred, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here today, and, and I'm glad to see such a great turnout here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, I'm privileged to introduce General John Allen, who's a uh, Longtime friend, a distinguished colleague, and a Marine that uh, we all admire. Uh, he's here today to talk on the, about the progress being made in his role. As uh, uh, Fred just uh, introduced, they were just suggested, um, his role as Special Presidential Envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL. So it's my pleasure to introduce a Marine who's been a distinguished public servant for almost 40 years. Um, uh, two quick stories. One is uh, John Allen... Uh, when he was a captain, was the recipient of a very coveted leadership award in the Marine Corps called the Leftwich Trophy in the late 1980s. And generally, the uh, well, specifically, that trophy is given to the most outstanding company commander in the Marine Corps, uh, recognized for his leadership and obviously future potential. And uh, John Allen was one of the ones who won that award in, in, the, in the late 1980s. And uh, in 2001, when I was the uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, I, was, I was asked to nominate a colonel, uh, a senior colonel, to serve at the Naval Academy. And I called this, the Chief of Naval Operations up, who was General Jay, uh, Admiral Jay Johnson at the time. And I said, Jay, I'm going to nominate uh, the, the one colonel in the Marine Corps that you will never be able to resist making the Commandant of Midshipmen because there'd never been a Marine Commandant of Midshipmen. And on the other end of the line, Admiral Johnson said, you mean John Allen? I said, exactly. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the first Marine to be the Commandant of Midshipmen at the Naval Academy. So General Allen is one of the Marine Corps' finest, uh, not only warfighters, leaders, intellectuals, and as we've all seen, uh, 
in the last few years, diplomats. His operational tours include Operation Sea Signal in the Caribbean, Operation Joint Endeavor in the Balkans, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and I'll have more to say on that in a minute, and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, all of the coveted travel spots that we all love to go to. In addition to his leadership skills, General Allen's intellect has been a particularly uh, uh, great asset to our country and to the Marine Corps. Uh, he furthered his education and training in the art of warfare and strategy uh, by serving as a Marine Fellow at uh, CSIS, a term member uh, of the Council of Foreign Relations for earning three separate master's degrees in security and strategic studies. And as a general officer, he served as principal director of the Asia Pacific Policy Section in OSD, where he worked on China, Mongolia, and Southeast Asia policy issues. The General Allen's great capacity for leadership was demonstrated in Iraq, where he played a key role in the Anbar Awakening, uh, which led him ultimately to be appointed as the commander of ISAF in 2011. The Anbar Awakening in Iraq was really the precursor to the surge, which uh, has received so much credit. But for those who really studied the, the operation, what happened in Ban Anbar was actually the precursor to all of the, the good things that happened as a result of the surge. In Afghanistan, uh, John Allen has provided strong and wise leadership to the coalition effort at a critical time of transition for NATO from the lead combat force to an advisory mission with Afghan forces in the lead. Uh, he's demonstrated the military leadership skills to successfully complete his mission and the necessary diplomatic skills and political skills to win the trust of our coalition and Afghan allies. And I, I do believe that under the leadership of President Ghani, we do have a shot at uh, Afghanistan uh, being an ultimate success story. So it is in no small part thanks to his leadership and the efforts of our brave men and women from the NATO coalition uh, forces that Afghanistan is potentially poised for success under the, the new president. Upon his retirement from the uh, Marine Corps, General Allen was praised from all sides of the political spectrum on both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue with our president calling him one of America's finest military leaders, a true patriot and a man I have come to respect greatly, unquote. General Allen has continued to lend his talents to our country in his uh, now civilian capacity, where he has served as the Secretary of Defense's senior advisor on Middle East security, while serving as a fellow at the Brookings Institute and a board member here at the Atlantic Council. He was appointed by President Obama as a special presidential envoy uh, for the co uh, Global Coalition to counter ISIL in September of 2014. Given his vast experience in Iraq and Afghanistan and his sophisticated understanding of complex insurgencies and his deft handling of complex operations, I can't think of a better presidential envoy to coordinate the global efforts to combat ISIL. And it's my pleasure to introduce him to you today for this follow-on discussion. John? General Jones, thank you very much for that extraordinarily generous introduction. Um, I will add uh, to your comments about being the first Marine Commandant uh, at the Naval Academy. I'm also the only uh, Marine who's been Commandant, and my classmates never miss the opportunity from Annapolis to tell me that perhaps the experiment didn't work out quite so well. So we're still waiting to see, and I hope there'll be another Marine soon. I think when you and I uh, began our military careers, we probably couldn't have imagined that there would be a time when two Marines would be allowed to speak in succession at a center named for a great Air Force general. Uh, and I guess it's just more of a sign of, of the nature of the Scowcroft Center and its uh, clear commitment to civility and to diplomacy. Uh, but sir, thank you. And it's been uh, very good to see you again and to be with you today briefly to have our conversation beforehand. And I know that across our long careers, we've shared many of the same experiences. And one of those, of course, is the experience of the Atlantic Council, uh, an institution that does so much to encourage robust global debate and dialogue. And I want to thank my old friend, Barry Pavel, 
uh, for supporting that dialogue here at the Scowcroft Center and for his insights into some, some of the most complicated and vexing security political questions in the Middle East, uh, questions uh, with which we've both spent a great deal of time grappling to this day. And Fred, I know that uh, we have had some time to talk uh, beforehand and we'll have some time to talk during the Q&A, but I, I wanted to thank you as well for your continued leadership of the Council. And during a very distinguished career as a journalist, whether it was in Beirut or in Berlin or here in Washington, you clearly had the talent for anticipating and understanding trends as they were first to emerge. The Atlantic Council is far stronger uh, because you have brought to that, this institution strategic insights to this group of august scholars and leaders. And of course, uh, this kind of strategic vision has also defined the public service of the center's great namesake, General Brent Scrowcroft. A few Americans can take more credit for steering the perilous course through the tumultuous period and the unpredictable period of the Cold War. And in hindsight, and as the passing years increase, the Cold War's peaceful conclusion may appear to have been inevitable. But as this audience knows better than most, it was by no means inevitable. Indeed, our nation and all for which we stand was in constant peril. I believe that the peaceful outcome was only possible because of leaders like Brent Scowcroft, because of public service, servants with unwavering courage, unparalleled intellect and unimpeachable integrity that we were able in the end to arrive at the far side of the Cold War as a nation whole and intact. And I've heard General Scowcroft summarize with a few humble words some of what he was able to witness and ultimately help to achieve. Quote, progress is only possible if the United States and its allies can work together, he's been known to say. And I've had reason to ponder these words in the past five plus months serving as the president's special envoy to the global coalition to counter ISIL. Since mid-September, I've traveled to 21 partner capitals, several repeatedly, to meet with the national leadership of these countries. And in that short span, we've assembled a global coalition which currently includes 62 nations and international organizations, each committed to the counter ISIL campaign. Now this is the fifth global coalition in which I've had the honor to participate, but the first where we've had to create the mechanisms and the structure and to guide our efforts from whole cloth. As the commander of ISAF, for example, our, our authorities derived from a United Nations Security Council resolution and our form rested upon the North Atlantic Council that simplified our otherwise enormous undertaking in Afghanistan. In building this kind of an organizational structure in this counter-ISIL coalition, it's easy to get bogged down in the detail, to look down at one's feet rather than at the strategic horizon. But what I've never lost sight of, and in fact, what has never been clearer to me, is the essential importance, indeed the centrality, of America's global leadership and the convening power that derives from that unique quality. There is simply no other global power either presently or on the horizon, that has the kind of strategic depth or diplomatic reach to convene the diverse coalitions and collections of nations needed to address the kind of borderless challenges that will shape the course of this century. And the challenge we face, face in ISIL is one of them. Whether one lives in Amman or in Canberra or in Singapore or in Kuala Lumpur, each of which I visited last month, or even here in North America, ISIL's threat is not confined to some distant or dark place or some foreign shore. In the form of foreign fighters and the spread of its toxic ideology, ISIL is a threat that is real, a threat that is here, and a threat that demands our urgent and assuredly our enduring attention. It was that urgency of that threat, that, that immediate emergency that we saw unfold last summer in Iraq that prompted me to accept the President's invitation in September to assist him in organizing a global coalition to resist ISIL. It's difficult to describe today just how desperate the situation was for Iraq last summer. By June, uh, ISIL fighters began pouring down the Tigris River Valley, 
Multiple Iraqi towns, including, including Mosul, a city of 1.5 million people, went down one after another under ISIL's boot. A substantial portion of Iraq's military units collapsed, and ISIL's subsequent and remorseless slaughter of Iraq's refugees and Iraqi religious minorities exposed us all to a stark, intolerable evil operating far beyond the pale of human behavior. Iraq was a nation torn asunder, under siege, on the edge of collapse, and largely alone in the world. As the emergency in Iraq unfolded, my thoughts were very much with my many dear friends in Iraq at the time, those facing a uniquely horrific threat. Today, less than eight months after ISIL fighters were threatening Baghdad, and six months after President Obama called for the global coalition to counter ISIL, we've achieved the first phase of the campaign. We've blunted ISIL's organizational, strategic, operational, and tactical momentum in Iraq. And, we under, and as we undertake coalition efforts to help to restore Iraq's territorial integrity, we're also seeing Iraq undertake vital reforms to make that, that sustainable transformation over time. Today, Iraq has both a more inclusive government and a new prime minister, Dr. Haider al-Abadi. While he has been in office only since September, Prime Minister Abadi has made a series of politically difficult and absolutely critical decisions to support a stronger and more unified Iraq. For example, Iraq's new government has come to an agreement with the Kurds on oil revenues, an agreement a decade in the making, one now reflected in the newly passed 2015 budget. <clears throat> Prime Minister Abadi put before Iraq's Council of Representatives that budget just last week, and it was passed by the votes of Shia, Sunni, and Kurdish politicians. The Prime Minister also priced into the budget funding for a National Guard, one that would allow Iraqis to serve and provide security for their own provinces. And today, the National Guard legislation was read for the first time in the Parliament. Prime Minister Abadi has issued an executive order to withdraw Prime Minister Maliki's challenge to laws devolving more authority to Iraq's provinces, a change long sought by Iraqi Sunnis and Kurds. And he has mourned the death of Sunni colleagues in their own mosques, and he has met with Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani, a vital endorsement of his leadership at a critical moment. And perhaps most importantly, Prime Minister Abadi has spoken out aggressively and proactively against all forms of sectarian violence. Most recently yesterday, as Iraqi security forces kicked off their offensive to recover Tikrit. He's called this violence a scourge, no less dangerous to Iraq's future than ISIL. Of course, Prime Minister Abadi's efforts to reconcile Iraq's divisions and to reform its government remain an enormous undertaking. The results are as yet uncertain, but his efforts spur to spur economic revitalization are challenged deeply by the historic decline of the price of oil. So make no mistake, Iraq has a tough road ahead. Supporting a secure and stable Iraq will require a sustained effort from the coalition, whether it comes to standing up Iraq's security forces or confronting extremist bigotry these efforts require our realistic expectations. And these expectations are reflected in the three-year time frame, for example, that the President included in his formal request for the authorization for the use of military force against ISIL. The AUMF, as it is called, requests that, that request foresees using our unique capabilities in support of partners on the ground, instead of through large-scale deployments of U.S. ground forces. The President has asked for flexibility to fight an adaptable enemy, one that hopes to expand its reach well beyond the borders of Iraq and Syria. So as we pursue this campaign with our coalition partners, there will be some advances and there will be setbacks. There will also be some incredibly heart-wrenching moments, something I've learned from my previous coalition efforts. And I have to tell you, these moments don't become any easier. The world's attention was riveted by the beheading of the Japanese journalist Kenji Goto, Gen Kenji Goto, or the emulation of the courageous Jordanian pilot Moab al kasaspa and the death of Kayla Mueller, an innocent and selfless American aid worker. But what is often missed by the world are the unspeakable depredations meted out daily 
to the wretched people under ISIL's heel, such that the horror of the murders of ISIL's high-profile captives is repeated hundreds and hundreds of times a day across the misery of these conquered people. None of us can hear reports of ISIL selling hundreds of women and girls into slavery and say that we're powerless to act. None of us can see ISIL desecrate holy sites and murder spiritual leaders, Sunni, Shia, and Christian alike, and not see something sacred in us all being violated. None of us can allow ISIL to threaten the existence of entire populations and remain silent. And we were horrified at the sickening spectacle of an ISIL-affiliated militant group executing 21 Coptic Christians on a Libyan beach. These atrocities must be consigned to the darker chapters of world history. With the coalition we've now assembled and through our coordinated action, we send a clear and un unambiguous message that we will not accept, we will not be desensitized, we will not accept ISIL's vicious assault on human dignity as some kind of new normal. What we've seen in recent weeks is that the series of brutal acts ISIL has broadcast to the world has in fact galvanized the coalition to greater action. Last month I saw that redoubled commitment firsthand when I met with His Majesty King Abdullah in Jordan, in Amman, in the immediate aftermath of the martyrdom of Captain al Qasaspa. As I expressed my personal condolences to His Majesty and to the Jordanian people, his determination to honor the sacrifice of Captain al Qasaspa and to honor his life and his faith couldn't have been more clear and more palpable. Now, as Iraqis begin to recover more of their country from ISIL and our coalition intensifies its efforts, there will be more hard days to come, and we must gird ourselves for these challenges as we face them. But in my experience, I've seen the possibilities that lay behind the, beyond the horizon when partners maintain their focus and set a clear strategic a set of objectives and work towards them with mutually reinforcing lines of effort. I've seen how sustained cooperation and the pursuit of a shared strategy can lead to unity of purpose and transformation. Wherever coalition nations have coordinated airstrikes with capable partners on the ground, we've seen ISIL stopped in its tracks, especially in Iraq. But because we lack the same kinds of partners on the ground in Syria, the situation there is more challenging and much more complex. Still, we're working closely with regional partners to establish sites for training and equipping vetted moderate Syrian opposition elements to train approximately 5,000 troops per year for the next three years. And every day, Secretary Kerry is working with energy and persistence to create the diplomatic space that will make possible a political solution to solve, solve Syria's crisis once and for all. But nonetheless, it is difficult to overstate the political complexities and the challenges in Syria. So even as we press ahead on the political track, it's useful to look at the particular example of what was possible in Syria when coalition capabilities and coalition firepower is paired with capable ground forces and diplomatic creativity which was the defeat of ISIL at Kobani. We do not hold Kobani up as a grand template for all future battles, but there are lessons we can and should not ignore that relate to our larger strategy. I said in November that ISIL would impale itself on Kobani, and last month we saw how that came to pass. And let me be clear, Kobani was strategically important because ISIL made it strategically important, a profound misjudgment on their part on a par with their misjudgment in attacking Erbil. It sent hundreds of fighters, some of their most qualified leaders, to fight in Kobani because it wanted desperately to broadcast a victory for the entire world to see. Of course, the cameras perched just across the border in Turkey captured a far different story. And thanks to the determination of Kobani's defenders, diplomatic creativity that opened up a, a Turkish corridor for the Kurdish reinforcements from the, of the Peshmerga, and support from coalition airstrikes, ISIL, had stopped the, ISIL was stopped there, and Kobani was ultimately liberated. ISIL's defeat in Kobani has clearly exploded the myth of its invincibility and damaged their morale. ISIL fighters saw unit after unit of their comrades sent to Kobani, often to the same precarious tactical positions where they were certain to be killed. We're sensing damage done by ISIL's defeat in Kobani, in a growing dissent within ISIL's 
command structure, and in growing numbers of desertions, and in the growing number of executions used by ISIL commanders to instill fear in their ranks and rank and file and greater discipline amongst the troops. And today we see further momentum of defenders pushing out well beyond Kobani, deeper into Syria, to liberate more territory to the east. The military aspect of campaigns like this will invariably receive greater attention from the media and from policymakers. But as I saw in Afghanistan in my command there, in Al Anbar in 2007 and 08, and in recovery efforts for the 2004 and 5 South Asian tsunami, the military response to this kind of emergency is essential, but it is not sufficient. It will ultimately be the aggregate pressure of the coalition's activity over multiple mutually supporting lines of effort that will determine whether we will succeed or fail. That is why when I visit a coalition capital and I meet with a prime minister or a king or a president, I describe the counter ISIL strategy as being organized around five lines of effort. The military line to be sure, to deny safe haven and provide security assistance, but also disrupting the flow of foreign fighters, disrupting ISIL's financial resources, providing humanitarian relief and support to its victims, and counter messaging or defeating ISIL as an idea. The issue of foreign fighters has grown to be a prominent, if not the preeminent topic of concern in all of these conversations, and rightly so. There is clearly a growing awareness that the thousands of young men who have traveled to fight in Syria and Iraq represent truly an unprecedented and generational challenge. Indeed, in, in the trip that I took just last month, in each capital where I briefed the leadership, this issue of foreign fighters was foremost on their minds. In ISIL and more broadly in the spread of extremism, we need to be prepared to confront the same dangers today, but now on a global scale. Coalition members are beginning to take the coordinated and hopefully increasingly concerted actions required to meet the emerging foreign fighter threat. More than a dozen nations have changed laws and penalties to make it more difficult to travel and fight in Syria and Iraq. Through capacity building in the Balkans, criminal justice efforts in North Africa, and through a 20 million euro investment from the European Union to engage in at-risk communities, we're beginning to see nations take a series of coordinated actions. And even with these expanded measures, foreign fighters continue to make their way to the battlefield. We must continue to harmonize our border and customs processes and promote intelligence sharing among our partners. And that is the intent of this line of effort. We have to be prepared for the foreign fighters to operate as a strategic asset as we've seen in places like Paris and Sydney, Brussels, Ottawa, and Copenhagen. Indeed, and increasingly, a foreign fighter or an ISIL sympathizer never even has to travel to or from Syria and Iraq to become a national security threat. So as we seek to interdict foreign fighters at home or en route to the battle space and returning from the front, we will need to develop the capacity to reach, rehabilitate, and reintegrate the thousands of these young men and increasingly young women who will eventually try to make their return home. And whether in fact we can, this will be a question and a challenge which the global community must grapple for many years to come. Last month in Singapore, I met with Muslim leaders and social scientists who have exerted enormous energy in understanding and in successfully developing protocols to de-radicalize young men, the victims of violent extremist ideology helping them transition back to being contributing members of a multicultural society. Success here is a very complex and challenging undertaking, but it deserves our intense study to derive even more examples of best practices and methods that may be applied in the different cultures of this diverse world. This kind of creative thinking and information sharing between partners is also critical to the related and similarly, similarly urgent challenge constraining ISIL's access to financial support. If you have the right intelligence and have the right partners working together, some of what can be achieved in the financial space can strike a substantial blow at ISIL's spending options and operational latitude. The coalition is not there yet, but we've made gains in synchronizing practices to block ISIL's access to banks, both in the region and globally. This includes staunching the flow of private donations, 
and constraining ISIL's financial options through diminishing its access to oil revenues. But their financial resources are diverse and for now nearly self-sustaining. For example, beyond the oil enterprise, ISIL's financial portfolio includes massive criminal extortion of the conquered populations, kidnap for ransom, and human trafficking and a, sex, and a slave trade, including a sex slave trade, which disgustingly ISIL takes great pride. We also know it can access substantial cash resources in the bank vaults across the captured territories. When ISIL is not destroying the precious works of antiquity, as we saw on the video broadcast from Mosul over the weekend, it's attempting to make millions, perhaps billions, from the sale of historical artifacts and artworks plundered from museums and from archaeological digs. They're literally attempting to eliminate Iraq's and Syria's rich cultures for the purposes of burying their region's future. As we expose the nature of ISIL's crimes to the world, we must also do so do more at a humanitarian level to support and rescue ISIL's victims. Saudi Arabia alone has donated 500 million in relief, as well as more than 12 medical camps, and numerous other important coalition partners, to include partners from the Gulf, have made substantial investments in education for refugees and in host communities that support them. Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey are to be commended for their generous hosting of several million refugees. The United States leads the world with our nearly four billion humanitarian contribution. Certainly we can take a measure of pride in that, but we and our coalition partners must be prepared and must do more. As more territory is taken back from ISIL, we must also ensure that we're poised to act in the relief of the liberated populations and to support the return of internally displaced persons. We're working closely with the Iraqis now with the support of our coalition partners and in particular our, Arabs, our partners among the Arab states to help Iraq develop stabilization and recovery plans as the counteroffensive begins to unfold. The coalition's counter-messaging line of effort in contesting ISIL's narrative across the many platforms and languages they use to spew their toxic message is essential to the outcome. ISIL seems attractive to many of its recruits because they proclaimed a caliphate launched onto the world stage with an illusion as I said, of inevitability and invincibility. Where ISIL once proclaimed itself to be on the march, it is today under unparalleled pressure and increasing pressure from military activities and the other lines of effort, from a world uniting ultimately to push back against this savagery. In any operation, military, humanitarian, counter-messaging, we need to define success at the outset. And when I think about success and what it must look like, I think about my young grandson. I ask myself whether the world that he will inherit will be different from the one in which I've spent most of my career. And I'm not the only one in this room who has spent the better part of his or her life at war or preparing for it. If we do not get this effort right, our children and our grand grandchildren will have to endure the same and perhaps far more dangerous consequences as we know that ISIL and other end of times extremist organizations seek to possess weapons of mass destruction. ISIL is the current emergency, but we should not, forget that, <clears throat> should not forget the future that millions of young people across the region hope to forge when they streamed onto the streets of their capitals just a few years ago. They were motivated by a common desire for education and jobs, for a freedom to determine their own future. No different from that which all of us would want for our families and the generations who will follow us. We should not forget how these young people used technology so effectively to share their struggle and their story with the world. And just think for a moment about what would have been, been possible for these same young people, so hopeful for peace and prosperity, where they joined not in protest, but in efforts to innovate and ultimately to gain a better life for themselves and their countries. So as we confront this current emergency, we must also seize the moment's promise to create a rising tide of opportunity to propel a young generation forward in dignity. That must be our common aspiration. That is our common goal. And we should also keep in mind that if we do not act in concert, if we don't use this moment of crisis as an opportunity to grapple with the underlying causes of extremism, ISIL II and the son of ISIL are surely in our future. We will leave a perpetual, perpetual struggle to future generations 
and a bitter inheritance. So within this coalition and as a community of nations, we will never find complete agreement. It's not within our power to prevent every source of conflict uh, between our peoples and other nations. But what we can do, what we must do, is strive for a unifying vision to guide the future we shape together. As more than 60 nations continue this campaign against ISIL, that is the broader, more distant horizon we must imagine and the opportunity which we must seize. Thank you. General Allen, that's uh, uh, one of the most powerful and important statements I've heard on the situation that we're in now. Uh, really capturing not only the challenge we're up against, but also some uh, thinking about what we have to do to uh, adjust our vision, adjust our sights, and how we take it on. So let me start. Um, let me start uh, with a few questions, and then uh, you know uh, I'll turn to the audience. Okay. Um, you really um, paint a picture of a battlefield that goes way beyond the military and way beyond Iraq and Syria. And to, uh, uh, and to an ISIL and related parties that is morphing. Uh, my question is, how are you seeing it morphing? Uh, the, I spoke recently with President Ashraf Ghani of Afghanistan, and he spoke about an ecology of terror and, started, and signs that Daesh was now in Afghanistan as well, we know they're in Syria. So what is this, uh, and, and look at Denmark, look at uh, France, how is it morphing? Uh, what is your assessment of ISIS and, and, and its, its threat? I know you went into some detail, but maybe you can drill a little deep, deeper. And more importantly, uh, how must the coalition morph in order to take this on? What are its current strengths and weaknesses? Well, let's talk first about the coalition. Um, I think without exception, the, the members of the coalition as, as they have joined the organization today uh, are united uh, ultimately in the intent to defeat ISIL. Uh, and they are broadly in agreement on, on Iraq. Mm. Uh, and uh, the issue of Syria is challenging uh, for the coalition, but uh, they are nonetheless committed at this point uh, to our strategic goals. Uh, the challenge uh, that has been evolving over the last uh, several months <clears throat> has been the emergence of organizations outside what could be considered the contiguous area of our initial commitment, which was Iraq and Syria. And those organizations which have put their hand in the air ultimately to uh, become affiliated with or to join uh, the ISIL movement is something that we're watching very carefully and very closely. Uh, some of these organizations have uh, real uh, capacity. Uh, the the uh, Ansar Bit al Maktis with the ABM uh, on the Sinai Peninsula has inflicted heavy casualties on the Egyptians. The ISIL affiliated organization in, uh, in Libya, for example, uh, that uh, executed the 21 Coptic Christians. Uh, that was both a visual uh, and a reality that I think shocked the world and certainly uh, shocked the Egyptians. Uh, there are other elements around the world that uh, have put their hands in the air, that have been uh, proclaimed as affiliates, <clears throat> and we're going to have to watch them closely. Uh, I've been uh, to the Middle East, I've been to uh, throughout Europe, uh, I've now been to Southeast Asia, and wherever I travel, uh, the leadership of those countries are worried about those particular organizations uh, for fear or of concern that they could uh, destabilize the the equilibrium, uh, the, the social fabric within their own countries. They could be a direct threat to the security of the countries. They're concerned about that. Uh, they're watching them closely, uh, but they're also concerned that those organizations beyond the potential domestic challenge that they could pose uh, to those countries, they're also concerned that they will produce uh, a, be a continued source of foreign fighters as well, which will uh, help uh, ISIL to regenerate its ranks over time. So we have to watch this closely. Uh, it has uh, begun to emerge uh, in a way that uh, is attracting our attention. Uh, and we have to ensure that 
we're able you know, clearly to, to prioritize, given the limited resources of the coalition, to prioritize the manner in which that we would respond. Uh, and ultimately, even the coalition will have to make decisions about how we will respond. Uh, but it's something that we're watching very closely, not just for the potential uh, for the threat to the national security of individual coalition members, but also because of the continued uh, source that it can be of uh, foreign fighters to uh, support uh, Daesh and the caliphate directly inside uh, Iraq and Syria. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, um, just hearing your speech, uh, one can't help but think of how uh, um, the challenges you have in your current position. We've uh, uh, committed that we're going to keep this conversation at a at a strategic level and a contextual level on the coalition and on ISIL, and not get into <coughs> operational elements that uh, that. Uh, uh, um, uh, that would be unhelpful. What I'd like to touch on is you talked in your speech about the recent escalations, the beheadings, uh, Libya, the, the Japanese situation, etc. cetera. Um, there are some who believe that uh, the escalations are a trap we should not fall into, uh, that, uh, that they're an effort to provoke American and Western reaction, and that by striking militarily, you could actually strengthen the network and you could strengthen uh, their ability to recruit, their ability to raise funds. And then there are others who say it, this really does call for escalated military commitment. How do you actually walk this line where on the one hand you have to take on this enemy, on the other hand you have to be, uh, you have to be careful about uh, walking into whatever trap they may be setting and how do you look at it in your position? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think we have seen before where the introduction of, of Western forces, or more precisely foreign forces, uh, into uh, a, another country's social fabric uh, can create uh, unanticipated consequences, can, can really create a potential disruption to the social fabric. <clears throat> and so we, we consider that very carefully when the conversation comes up about boots on the ground and whether an escalation uh, requires a specific uh, American uh, ground force or Western ground force involvement. Uh, happily, at this point, uh, Prime Minister Abadi and, and his leadership, and I've spent a good bit of time uh, with them in Iraq, uh, have been very clear that uh, the restoration of the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of Iraq is for Iraqis to do. Uh, and they're, they're grateful for uh, what we've done. The air campaign has has in fact uh, stopped the operational, uh, strategic operational and tactical momentum of Daesh. There are still areas on the ground where uh, Daesh and uh, Iraqi and tribal uh, security forces will trade ground from time to time, but by and large, it's strategically and operationally arrested. They're grateful for that. They're grateful for our advisory assistance uh, for those elements in the field that, uh, that are able to fight today. Uh, and they're also grateful for the, the training and equipping program that uh, is underway in Iraq uh, at four different camps ultimately to help to regenerate the capability of the Iraqi security forces. So just in Iraq, uh, the attitude of the central government and frankly the attitude of uh, the tribes and sheikhs that I have talked to uh, is that this is for Iraq to do. And we're glad for the help. Uh, we're happy that uh, you're able to assist us in our training and provide us equipment and firepower we're glad for all of that, but in the end, Daesh has to be defeated by us. Uh, another side of the same conversation is one that, uh, that I think is also important, and that is that uh, His Majesty King Abdullah of uh, Jordan has also been very clear that, that this is a war uh, for the future of Islam. Uh, and this is a war that has to be led ultimately by the Arab states in the region, uh, those states in the region for whom uh, the faith is being contested. And they need to take leadership and ownership in that. And I, uh, we certainly applaud uh, that view. Uh, it is shared widely in the region, uh, which puts us in large, in large part, particularly in the coalition, uh, in a role of supporting and enabling uh, that uh, intent, ultimately, uh, both to deal with Daesh, uh, but also uh, to recover in their mind, uh, the faith of Islam from what Daesh has done 
uh, to it in a, in a, in a public environment. Um, uh, you were complimentary of uh, the Iraqi leadership of Abadi in your, in your opening statement again now. Uh, are, do you feel that the coalition Abadi are on a single page? Do you see air, uh, do you see a light uh, uh, between coalition members and uh, 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 the Iraqi leadership at this point in any respect? Um, well, in the end, <clears throat> this is a, 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 a new government. Uh, it is a government that, uh, or a leader in particular in the person of the prime minister, uh, who is dramatically different than his predecessor. Uh, he has uh, been able to complete uh, a cabinet uh, for the first time in some numbers of years. He's been able to pass a budget for the first time in some number of years. Uh, he has uh, spoken of increasing the inclusivity of the government. Uh, and in being able to pass the budget, I think we have uh, an indicator of the, the willingness of the various major components of the political spectrum in participating constructively. Uh, that said, we have to also recognize that this is a young government. It's, it's at a moment uh, of real turbulence uh, within uh, Iraq with respect to what Daesh has done. Uh, it's, a, it's a moment of... Uh, uh, of political challenge for him as he seeks to reach out to the Sunni elements of the population uh, and balance uh, the Shia elements within the government that support him. Uh, so I, I don't have a sense from members of the coalition that there's daylight between them. In fact, uh, the, the central government in Baghdad has done a lot in outreach to the region. Uh, outreach with the Turks, uh, with Jordan, with uh, Saudi Arabia, with the Emirates, uh, with Qatar. Uh, there has been outreach there that we have just not seen uh, in many years. Uh, and that, that makes for options. It provides for decision making, latitude for decision making. It provides for additional, more widespread support uh, in the region amongst many other kinds of people, uh, rather than having one option or very few options. And so, uh, the initiatives domestically that Prime Minister Abadi has embraced, uh, his willingness and the elements within the government from the Prime Minister through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, through the President of, the, of, uh, of Iraq, uh, all of them on the road uh, regularly visiting uh, European and regional and uh, important partners, I think has, uh, has made for, uh, has given a sense of optimism uh, uh, that we had not seen before, but also uh, it's important that we recognize <clears throat> that this is a tenuous moment mm -hmm. for them. Uh, it's tenuous because of what uh, Daesh has done. It's tenuous because of the difficulties that will be associated with reclaiming uh, the, the territory of, uh, of Iraq. Uh, and uh, this prime minister has to walk uh, a relatively narrow uh, political trail uh, to ensure that all members uh, of uh, his government, uh, the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shia, uh, all feel as though their interests are best served in the future of Iraq. Uh, and that, of course, is how we depict our efforts uh, in Iraq. It's not about the Sunnis. It's not about Daesh. It's not a, it is about Daesh, but it's not about a particular group. It's about all Iraqis for a united Iraq. And in that regard, it, our intent within the coalition is to support the Prime Minister and his cabinet and his, uh, his security forces, uh, and more broadly, other areas of government in restoring the integrity of the country. Uh, thank, thank you, General Allen. Um, here, uh, with this question, I'm going to call a little bit on your um, expertise also as a Marine general, uh, assessing tactical abilities, requisite capabilities of Iraqi forces and associated forces uh, to take on ISIL. Um, we, we, there was an anonymous US official that said that 20 to 25,000 Iraqi and Peshmerga forces were readying an assault on ISIL uh, militants to reclaim Mosul. Others were saying that these forces might not be ready to carry out the kind of urban warfare operations similar to what the US had to do in Fallujah uh, during the <coughs> Iraq war. Now you see, and you mentioned in your comments to Crete, um, uh, you know, maybe I've just not been following this closely enough, but I had been focused up until today, yesterday, on Mosul more than to Crete. Um, uh, 
I know you may not be able to focus on some of this, but can you assess what you think the capabilities of the Iraqi and Peshmerga forces are regarding Mosul, and then also what we should be looking for now in this situation uh, from the outside into Crete? Um, well, I think the, the difficulties with Mosul uh, of late was, was an attempt to um, portray it along a timeline. Uh, and as President uh, Obadi, or excuse me, Prime Minister Obadi said recently in a, I believe it was a BBC interview, he said, we'll do Mosul when we're ready. Yeah. And, and that's the bottom line. We'll do Mosul when we're ready. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that uh, operations like this, Mosul is not the only battle. Uh, it'll certainly be an important battle uh, in the campaign. Uh, but as we sit here right now, the fighting is raging. Uh, for possession of Tikrit. Uh, but there's also fighting going on in, in Al-Anbar along the Euphrates River. Uh, there is also uh, security activities being conducted nearly constantly by the Kurds in the north. So there's activity, there's pressure being applied everywhere. Uh, and the, the point about Mosul, or the point about any aspect of the counteroffensive, is less about the timing than it is about the preparation. And it's important to remember that, that that preparation isn't just about the clearing force. Uh, it's, it's about the holding force, or the hold force, as it's often called, which in most cases will be about the police and the law enforcement, which will provide for the security of the population in the aftermath of the clearing operations. It'll be about uh, the leadership element that will ultimately uh, reestablish uh, control of the population in that municipality or in that city and tie that city uh, back into the central government, probably through the governorate. And then very importantly, it's for the, uh, it's also has to be considered in, in the context of what's done for the liberated population. Uh, these populations we're going to discover, uh, as we have in other places in, in Iraq, to create being the current fight and Mosul eventually, uh, these populations have uh, endured enormous uh, abuse and deprivation. Um, and what we will have to do is we'll need to be poised uh, in the course of the counteroffensive to be able to apply quickly the relief to these populations that will be necessary. Uh, there will be individuals who live uh, throughout Iraq who will want to come home uh, to their city or to their town, and those, those IDPs, those internally displaced persons, will come home. We'll need to be able to provide for them. Iraq will need to be able to provide for them. And then, of course, the restoration of essential services, and then finally, reconstruction. The counteroffensive is all of those things. It's not just uh, what is sometimes reduced in, in understanding to simply the clearing force. Uh, because moving Daesh out of the population is part of it. Ultimately, embracing that population back into the mainstream of Iraq and caring for it in the aftermath of what Daesh has done for it, those multiple components, that really is the is the the counteroffensive in its entirety. So when someone like Prime Minister Abadi says, we'll do Mosul when we're ready, <clears throat> that's what he means, when we're ready. And we've got to be very careful and we need to resist uh, trying to put a timeline on it. We just need to be ready when the time comes. Um, let me pick that up uh, because um, this then gets to the question of governance in ISIL and what we're learning about the governance of ISIL in the areas that it takes. On the one hand, one sees important areas of escalation, almost it looks as, as, as if it's expansion. On the other hand, uh, and you were talking about how they're building up uh, ways to earn money and maybe self-supporting at this point. What have we learned about uh, uh, the governance of ISIL, and is, 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 are, are they getting their act together in that respect, or is this, is, are they going to be self-defeating? Uh, and then as you go in, you were talking about what one has to bring in uh, uh, later on. Uh, uh, we've taken some Twitter questions, and uh, Christina Beshvidan from the University of Warwick in England was asking along those lines whether you have a multi-dimensional strategy mm -hmm. and whether it includes humanitarian support Absolutely. to meet the immediate needs when you go in. So maybe you can talk both about what we're learning about ISIL governance and, and is it working, is it not working? Uh, 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 could they, uh, through their extremism, uh, uh, blow themselves up, so to speak? Sure. Uh, and, and then also our own strategy. Um, the, the reporting is, 
is, uh, is mixed coming from the populations that are under ISIL occupation. But it is almost uniformly uh, trending from negative to horrendous. Uh, I can't imagine that there is uh, any element of, well, absolutes are always a problem. But I can say with a high level of confidence there are very few Iraqis today and very few of the Syrians who live under the boot of ISIL that uh, would prefer uh, that as the permanent system of government and, and societal control. Put a different way, uh, ISIL's subjugation of these populations has been horrendous. Uh, and those elements that have been able to get out from underneath the, the boot of ISIL have come out with a whole series of, of really uh, horrific stories of the things that, that the individuals within that society have had to endure. And at any given point, uh, we heard not long ago in one particular town, <clears throat> the sense that uh, ISIL had stopped uh, the summary public executions uh, for some period of time. And the, the question uh, was put to the individual who had come out, it was, was that because things had improved? And the answer was no. We were so, we the population under ISIL's domination, uh, were so completely cowed by the early execution of virtually everyone who would have opposed them that uh, the, the solution ultimately was not to resist. So ISIL isn't going to get its governance together. ISIL isn't going to be a preferred system of government. Uh, now, to the, the question, uh, the important question about humanitarian assistance, I, <clears throat> I addressed that a moment ago. And humanitarian assistance comes in really two very large uh, approaches. One is, of course, the overall uh, effect that has uh, uh, of uh, of ISIL and the Syrian civil war on the populations of Syria and Iraq. And the UN has worked very hard in its appeals uh, to organize the kind of support that's necessary for those populations. Uh, then there is the support to the populations which have departed Syria and Iraq and, and have taken up residence in, in huge numbers uh, in uh, Turkey and in Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, and in every one of those countries, not uh, more so even than simply counting the numbers of refugees, the, the sheer numbers in those populations uh, has had effect on the equilibrium in those societies in some respect. And so we have to keep that uh, in account. And so you have the populations themselves, you have the, what we would call the frontline states, and those are the, the, the large humanitarian challenges that we face. And, and it's magnified, obviously, by the the time of the year, the, the winter, and the, the privation that these individuals have to face. And then specifically to the counteroffensive, as I said a moment ago, uh, as Daesh is defeated in these population centers and as they're pushed out, and as we discover what's been left in those population centers, uh, there will be an immediate need for humanitarian relief and maybe even humanitarian rescue provide medical care and assistance to the populations that are there. It's not entirely clear how many uh, individuals remain in uh, Tikrit uh, or even how many are in Mosul. I met recently with the mayor of Fallujah who indicated that as much as 80% of the population had displaced, were not in the city. But nonetheless, uh, it's really important to our planning within the counteroffensive that as Daesh is pushed out of the city, as the the hold force, as the police provide security uh, to the population that has freshly been liberated, that very quickly on the heels of those two things, uh, we're providing medical assistance to the populations, uh, food, uh, restoring uh, electricity if necessary, restoring the, the flow of fresh water, uh, taking care of those elements within the population that seek to come home. Uh, and then over the longer term, uh, dealing with the issue associated with the reconstruction uh, of large uh, segments of these towns and cities. Uh, so whether it's How a, effectively do you think that's happening thus far? We're, in fact, I'm leading a, a, an element into Iraq next week uh, to uh, sit with the Iraqi leadership uh, to work with them on the detailed planning associated with, with mm -hmm. this. So it is something about which the Iraqis are deeply concerned. Uh, it's something that uh, they have uh, grappled uh, with to this point. It's something that I know they're absolutely committed to. But the, by and large, the, the recovery of populations is only now beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so ensuring that they're ready 
both in terms of the material readiness, but also ready in, in, the ter in terms of integrating those requirements into a comprehensive counteroffensive uh, is an area where we hope to be helpful. Um, uh, Twitter question, Sarah El Cheney of the Foreign Policy Association asking about uh, the situation in Syria and, and, uh, and really the complicated situation where you're not just focusing on ISIS, but you also have an issue with Assad. Um, talk a little bit about that. Let's shift our focus a little bit towards Syria if one actually can. I guess one of my questions is it possible actually to draw a line uh, between those two conflicts. But clearly in Syria it's a more complex situation since you don't have a single f fight against ISIL. I wonder from your position whether you can see, give, let us into how your uh, view has evolved on that issue. Um, well, you, you summarized it well. Uh, it's about as complex an issue as, uh, as we're facing right now. Uh, it's not an issue that is solely about uh, ISIL. Uh, we view ISIL as a regional threat, uh, a threat immediately to Iraq and Syria. Uh, increasingly, as I said previously, we view uh, ISIL as a potential overseas threat of, as, you, uh, as well uh, over time, perhaps a global threat. So we're going to watch that very closely. Mm -hmm. uh, in Syria, you have uh, the challenge of, of the synchronization of the counter-ISIL strategy uh, with the reality on the ground that uh, those elements with whom uh, we would seek, to whom we would like to empower and with whom we'd seek to uh, create a capability, uh, the moderate Syrian opposition, they are uh, seriously threatened and, uh, and seriously challenged uh, by the regime uh, and the, the elements fighting alongside the regime by Jabhat al-Nusra uh, and by Daesh and by uh, other elements uh, within that population. Uh, so the moderate Syrian opposition uh, is very challenged right now and how we help them today, uh, how we seek to uh, create capacity uh, within uh, the elements of the Syrian population that we would like to train and equip ultimately to deal with Daesh uh, in Syria, uh, that's the challenge that we face. But Syria is a very complicated uh, issue. It's not just an issue of dealing with Daesh, it's, it's an issue dealing ultimately with the political outcome in Syria. And I think within the coalition uh, there is a broad agreement that uh, the, there is no military solution ultimately to the outcome in Syria. Uh, certainly the military solution sets potentially the conditions for other things to occur. Uh, but the, a productive political diplomatic track will be important over time. Uh, and the U.S. policy is that we would like to see a political outcome uh, in Syria, and that political outcome not include Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and uh, I would, I'm careful not to speak for all the coalition members or even completely for the coalition, uh, but that, uh, that view of a political outcome that does not include Bashar al-Assad, I believe, is very widely held by the members of the coalition. The question uh, isn't the outcome. The question is, uh, it's not the ends. It's the ways and the means of getting there the timeline of doing it, and the modality, ultimately, of uh, Bashar al-Assad's uh, departure. Uh, on Syria, let's stick with that just for a moment. Um, uh, the Jordanian uh, pilots killing, the uh, greater involvement of the Jordanians, uh, UAE and the situation now with the UAE uh, stepping up again. Um, and uh, so talk a little bit about whether you're getting from coalition <clears throat> forces what you want in that respect. And if you can deal a little bit, we talked about it outside the room, uh, and, uh, about the uh, relationship with Turkey and how that has evolved. Uh, well, in terms of the uh, strike operations uh, that are underway in Syria at any given time, uh, I think the very first one in the the date escapes me off the top of my head, but the very first strike, op strike operation that we ran in Syria and uh, subsequent ones thereafter uh, found the, the United States and uh, five Arab partners flying in a single strike package against Daesh uh, targets in Syria. Uh, I don't think any of us could have imagined that that could ever have happened uh, on that particular night. And, and since that time, uh, Arab partners have been flying uh, on their own and uh, in, in uh, company with American aircraft uh, in additional strikes against Daesh targets in, uh, in Syria. Uh, and that has been a, a great accomplishment, frankly, uh, in, the, in the coalition. And it also has gone uh, to uh, the ambition, 
the desire of the Arab partners to take a leadership role uh, in this coalition, and they are, and that's an indication of that. Uh, with respect to Turkey, uh, and I say this publicly all the time, Turkey is an old friend of the United States and has been a close ally for many years and, of course, is a NATO partner. And the conversation that uh, we have been engaged in uh, with Turkey uh, since, uh, since I've uh, been involved in this process has been, uh, has been productive. Uh, where we are today in that conversation with respect to Turkey's involvement in the coalition uh, continues to evolve. There are a number of things uh, over which we still need to uh, uh, discuss uh, with regard to the future, uh, but the conversation is, is uh, amicable. Uh, it's a, a rich conversation. Turkey is committed to the coalition. It's committed to our objectives. Uh, but we still have uh, other things to talk about, and, and I won't go into the details here, uh, but I look forward to returning soon to Ankara and continuing uh, this productive conversation with them. Uh, General Johnson. Thank you. One of the, uh, the oh, wait for it. Sorry. One of the comments, uh, John, that you made, uh, I think struck uh, me as being absolutely correct, and that, that this is really about the, the future of Islam and it's going to be determined in large part by, by Muslims. Um, the, um, the voices of the clergy, it strikes me, is extremely important. And you and I had a conversation before this meeting, and you mentioned some things that I don't think, uh, at least I wasn't aware of in terms of various pronouncements. But how important is that? And what more, what should we be doing that we're not doing to get that uh, the, the uh, religious leadership uh, from the Muslim world uh, more actively involved in, in, in the Western consciousness? Thank you. Well, I think it's a, it's a very important uh, aspect of, uh, of the, the counter messaging uh, to put into, not just into context, the, the realities of what Daesh stands for the, and what the caliphate really is or isn't. Uh, but it's also very important and, and very, I, I believe, key, uh, credible. Uh, Muslim voices uh, to include uh, prominent uh, Muslim scholars and clerics have all spoken uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, uh, dramatic way uh, about the apparent doctrine of Daesh and ISIL uh, and the, uh, the doctrine of the caliphate. And that's important. Um, it's, it's important that the, the voice that opposes this doctrine be a Muslim voice. Uh, and in the Gulf, as it has been said to me, it's important that the, the face of the opposition or the face of influence be an Arab face and a Muslim voice. I was just in Southeast Asia where we had a similar conversation and they had uh, an, an identical view there that there has to be a credible Muslim voice speaking out on behalf of the faith and condemning uh, the, the uh, doctrine of Daesh and the, and the caliphate. Uh, to that extent, uh, a a uh, messaging center has been uh, created and opened in, in the Emirates uh, with important leadership from the Emirates. Uh, it'll, there will be members of the coalition uh, in that center because in the end, the voices of the Gulf have to speak out on behalf of the faith and the people of the Gulf. We may well see a messaging center opened in Southeast Asia for exactly the same reason, so that people of that region and voices from that region speak out on behalf of their people and speak out on behalf of their faith and condemn uh, Daesh for what it is. What's important about the, the role and the pronouncements of the religious leaders is it also helps us to deny the attractiveness of the message for the purposes of foreign fighters. There are many communities at risk uh, in uh, countries around the world, and, and those communities uh, seek to, to uh, limit the, the voice of Daesh and the influence of Daesh so that their young, their young men and increasingly young women uh, are not beguiled by the promise, this false promise of the caliphate uh, that would cause them either to do uh, horrible things to their own populations or travel great distances to fight uh, in a war where increasingly we have discovered that the foreign fighters aren't finding it uh, to be the utopia that they had been promised. Uh, and the reporting from the, from the region of uh, foreign fighters being executed by Daesh because they want to go home, those, those reports are increasing constantly. So the, the condemnation by religious leaders is essential. The voice of Islam must speak for Islam. The face of the region must speak for the region. And the more we're able to coordinate that uh, in a coherent way, the more we can oppose 
uh, the, the idea of Daesh while we're fighting the physical presence of Daesh in these countries. Thank you. Ambassador. Yesh Kabar, I'm a Croatian ambassador. So talking about Islam and Iraq, uh, you haven't been, you haven't mentioned uh, the uh, the sectarian divide that exists between the Shia and the Sunni uh, parts of uh, Iraq. So we are talking about uh, well, ISIL is obviously a streak of Sunni Islam. Mm -hmm. Then, well, the government in uh, in Baghdad is predominantly Shia-led, so uh, it is encouraging what you have uh, said about the aftermath of the uh, victory, military victory. So, uh, has there been a serious conversation about how many uh, Sunni uh, Iraqi government uh, fighters are going to be amassed? In in, uh, in in facing ISIL, also uh, has there been uh, any serious talks about uh, what kind of civilian power or civilian government is being is going to be established on the territories mm -hmm. uh, that uh, will be liberated from ISIL? Well, that's a really important question. Um, you know, in the end, we have said that it's so important that Iraq be for all Iraqis. Uh, for now. Uh, and it should come as a surprise to no one, uh, much of the security force uh, that's in the field, much of the security force that is available for training is Shia. Uh, the, the challenge is frankly not that. That's a reality that we have to face. What we, the challenge that we face is the professionalization of these organizations, the professionalization of the Iraqi security forces. Um, and ultimately, what becomes uh, of the militias? Uh, and how do we get the Iraqi Sunnis into the game? Uh, for now, obviously, much of the Sunni population uh, has either um, uh, departed uh, the, the typical Sunni provinces within Iraq or live under the domination of, uh, of Daesh. And just as an example of, of where we think there could be progress and where we hope there will be continuing progress, is in the province of Al Anbar, uh, and a base there called Al Assad, which was a was a Marine Corps base for a long time during the war uh, back uh, that ended in '11. Uh, we now have, uh, in, it is one of four training centers uh, where we're not only training the 12 Iraqi security force brigades. Uh, that we have committed to train. The United States and the coalition partners have committed to train 12 of these brigades. Uh, not only are we training brigades there, and they cycle through the training program, uh, we are also training the 7th Iraqi Army Division. Uh, we're also training there uh, the tribes. Uh, and those, those elements of the tribes that can get to Al Anbar for now uh, we're training them through uh, special forces, our special operations forces and allied special operations forces, to give them capacity, both in terms of their training and their equipage, to fight alongside the Iraqi security forces, which will conduct operations increasingly in the Al Anbar province. So for now, simply by dint of the state of the situation with the Sunni population, there's not nearly as many of them available, and they exist in a minority in any case in, in uh, Iraq. There's not many, as many of them as are available as we would want to populate the Iraqi security force ranks and ultimately to train the tribes. But as time goes on, and as we con continue to train more tribesmen, as we continue to train more Iraqi security forces, for example, the 7th Iraqi Army Division in Al Anbar is less than 50% strength right now. We'd like to see uh, Iraqi security force elements, or excuse me, tribal elements in Al Anbar, trained and inducted, ultimately into that division to begin to flesh out its, rank, its ranks with the newest elements of the population that are available to provide for the security of the population. Uh, to your point about uh, Shia and Sunni relations, this is essential ultimately for the outcome. Uh, how how the outcome of the counteroffensive unfolds how the liberated populations are treated, how the, how the populations that are liberated are rescued, 
by a central government that is largely Shia will determine in the end whether the Sunni population desires ultimately to be part of this experiment. Now, Prime Minister Abadi has been clear. He's a believer in, in functional federalism uh, and has spoken about uh, his willingness to provide greater autonomy ultimately to the Sunni areas. The National Guard is, a, is an example of that, where within a province, the population of that province would be recruited into a brigade. So it would be an indigenous element. And that element would answer to the, uh, the uh, governor of the province, primarily for the purposes of law enforcement, supporting the law enforcement elements uh, and humanitarian assistance, but could be federalized if necessary in the event of a national emergency. This is a change, and this is new, and uh, Prime Minister Abadi has both uh, encouraged that, but has also taken the block off of, of uh, po previous policies within the government to permit that kind of devolution of power to the provincial level. So it, it's hopeful. It is very hard right now, given the current situation in Iraq. I think we should expect that there will be continued political challenges to this, uh, but the fact that he's willing to say this publicly and has taken active steps uh, to try to accomplish this is uh, very positive. Thank you. Sandy Charles. No. no. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Please. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, sir. Great to see you, sir. Me or Sandy? Yes, please. First? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, uh, General Allen, uh, Farah al Atasi. Uh, I am not a military expert, but uh, being an activist in the Syrian revolution the past four years, going inside and outside Syria through the Jordanian border and the Turkish border, I saw up front uh, the challenges and dangers of operating and working in a conflict zone or in a war zone. So my question to you, how are you going to deploy 5,000 vetted trained Syrian opposition fighter inside Syria with no ground or air cover, with no safe corridors, with no fly zone, as if you are sending them to a suicide mission, not to a victory mission. And that will lead me to the second question quickly. How are you going to convince the 5,000 vetted Syrian opposition fighter to sacrifice their lives only to fight ISIS, whereas there are thousands of other Shia jihadist foreign fighters coming from South Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen, who are currently in Syria, killing more Syrian than ISIS, fighting with the Syrian regime. So how are you going to solve this reality and complexity? Thank so you. Let, let, let me pick up yeah. that. And I want to thank you for that question. Yeah. And, and, that, and, and that's going to have to be our last question. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but I want you to underscore one thing you talked about, which is you were talking about ISIL-2, ISIL-3, the fact that it can't just be military and kinetic means we take on. If you were just to pick out one thing, or one area of things we need to do beyond military to ensure that the next generation uh, isn't dealing with this. What is it? So, so deal with this operationally in Syria, and then maybe the larger question, and then I think we need to let you get back to your day job. Which is a night job, it would appear uh, right now. Um, you, you offered a series of potential limitations with regard to corridors and um, air cover and firepower. And, and let me just tell you that all of those things are under consideration. So it's, it's important that, uh, that you not believe that we would not support these fighters. Uh, I would also tell you that we're pleased with the numbers that have said they want to be part of this. Um, and I think if you know the terrain. Uh, you know that uh, well down the Euphrates at this particular moment from north and west of Raqqa all the way to Abu Kamal, uh, I don't think you're going to find too much difficulty finding people that want to deal with Daesh and eventually deal on the political level at some point in the future. So those are real dynamics and challenges that we're facing now. Um, we've been pleasantly surprised at the numbers that have been interested now in, in signing up vetting is, of course, an issue that we must pass through uh, and ultimately successfully completing the training and then, then successfully com protecting that force so that it does have operational capability. All of those are issues I don't want to get into in the operational detail, but it is clearly part of our plan that not only will we train them and we will equip them with the, the latest weapon systems, but we will also protect them when the time comes. And I think this is uh, an important dimension of the considerations, and I, I won't tell you where all our answers are going to be, but uh, it is certainly something that we're uh, constantly uh, watching. 
Um, you know, the, the issue of, uh, in the end, um, dealing with DASH, which is really a symptom of other things as opposed to necessarily the disease, is uh, to look at the, the potential for populations ultimately to have hope. Uh, and in those populations where, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, societal, political, economic, uh, religious, sectarian, uh, where the combination of factors has have in those societies um, denied hope uh, to segments of those populations. And it's not just about poverty. Some of the most honorable, productive people in the world are folks who live on very little uh, a day. It's not, it's not that organizations like Daesh or other extremist organizations can inherently recruit from them. Uh, it is, frankly, a matter of uh, individuals who, who have hope, who have the ability ultimately to care for their families, to provide for their children, uh, have some uh, uh, access ultimately to uh, education, and have hope. And where often, and this is obviously a very simplistic approach to this, because every country is different and every uh, grouping of people is different, but uh, and by, by and large, where we find people who have been denied uh, hope we find ground, ultimately, that is fertile uh, for radicalization, which could turn into extremism and ultimately for violence. And so the more that we're able to do, and there's been, a, I think, a very important conversation within the coalition, although the coalition is about Daesh, there has been a, an interesting uh, conversation that is growing within the coalition, uh, an introspection uh, um, between and among the members of trying to understand uh, in an important way what gives rise to an organization like Boko Haram? What can give rise to an organization like Daesh or Jabhat al-Nusra? And to try to understand and to get ahead of the circumstances which in the end create the opportunity for young men and women ultimately to leave home, to become uh, radicalized uh, and embrace violence as the means uh, on behalf potentially of their faith or on behalf of their sect or behalf of uh, their flag to embrace uh, a cause uh, which clearly puts them at, uh, at odds with the rest of social norms. And I, so I think it's a really Im important conversation that, that's beginning to emerge. I think the, the recent CVE conference here uh, created a, a fertile opportunity. Uh, whether we got to the answers or not at that conference is less important than we were able to create the opportunity for a conversation. And that conversation, and as I looked out across that crowd, uh, at the CVE conference here in town, it was the face of humanity that was there from all around the world. And the questions that were asked, the challenges that were uh, posed, uh, the outcomes that were proposed, I think all of that was a useful beginning to something that we have to grip. And that is if organizations like Daesh and organizations like Al-Qaeda and organizations like Boko Haram can find fertile ground and ultimately challenge uh, uh, societies and nation states, uh, it's, it's up to us ultimately to look at the causal factors that permitted something like that ultimately to, arrive, to arise and take what steps we can at the front end of these crises to, uh, to address those factors before they can give rise to Daesh II and son of Daesh in the future. General Allen, I think that's a really uh, fitting close to an incredibly important speech and discussion. Uh, thank you for taking so much time sure. with us, for your frankness. We know what a difficult situation you are in, the coalition is in, and we wish you the best in going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.